familiar to any person who reads the Bible, anybody who reads the Bible is familiar with what's going on. And what's going on is Jesus Christ is standing before Pontius Pilate. And when he stands there, Pilate is visibly impressed with him. And he says, Behold the man, like he was the only man in this world. He couldn't fool Pilate about man. He's a Roman emperor. He's got Roman soldiers under him. And he says, Behold the man in the passage. In the passage. He just had Christ quit with an inch of his life, and he's bleeding like a suck hog, and blood run all over his face and all down his back, quit to pieces, and a scarlet robe on him. And when Pilate brings him out there, Pilate expects the crowd to let him go, and and instead of Barabbas, the crowd disappoints him, and they want Barabbas let go, and they have Christ crucified. But I call your attention to these words, these three words, we'll talk about them a while this morning, and these three words are, Behold the man, behold the man. Now I want to say certain things about that text. And the first thing I want to say about this uh, text is, Behold, behold his light. I want you to look at that. Behold his light. There's no life lived like this for anyone upon the face of her. Nobody ever lived a life like Jesus Christ. And whether a man uh, doesn't believe on him or does believe on him, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, nobody lived a life like Christ lived, never been repeated, never will be repeated. If Darwin was right, somebody like Jesus Christ should show up at least once every hundred years. And you're getting better, you're progressing. Well, there will be more people more Christ-like, you know, after a thousand years, but just somehow or another they, they, they uh, diminish, they, 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 don't, they don't multiply, they subtract. You don't have anybody like him around. Uh, have you ever considered about, uh, have you ever compared his life to the life of other great men? I teach history, among other things, among other courses. I write my own textbooks as far as that goes in church history. And when I teach church history, I've got to teach about Gregory the Great, you know, and Leo the Great, and Frederick the Great, and Peter the Great. I get so tired of that. I get so tired of Frederick the Great, and Peter the Great, and left. how about Jesus the Great? Yeah. Okay. I mean, what they ever do in comparison to what he did? You take compare with Darwin. What what Darwin do for the human race except talk you out of your salvation? What ever do for you except tell you came from an animal? Does that help you any? Uh, who, 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 who lived like Jesus Christ lived? I don't know anybody. I've said the lives of great men. I don't know anybody had that spirit of hard work, great crowd of following. They couldn't even sleep. The crowd of following wherever they went, pestering him day and night. People calling him born out of wedlock, said your mother is a whore, you're born in a wedlock, you're a bastard. That's what they said to Christ. In John chapter 8, they said, we be not born of fornication. See, like you. Uh, that's what I'm going to say is you please today. You live but Mary had a child out of wedlock, just an ordinary child that worked miracles by a charm he stole from the temple. That's in the Talmud. But nobody ever lived like that. Uh, when you compare yourself with Jesus Christ, how do you come out? Do you have that spirit of gentleness he had? You know, Father, forgive me, Lord, what to do. Would I you keep your enemies? Would you die for your enemies? I wouldn't. <laughs> I'm not a bit like Christ. When I compare my life to his, I, I'm, I fall so far short, I wouldn't even get in the same league with him. We need Christ. You take that spirit of forgiveness, that tenderness, suffer a little children coming to me and forbid them not, you take that kind of thing. You can't get a life like that. Compare his life with the life of some pope. Here's some pope, you know, a papa dressed up like mama, and he's stepping out of an airplane on a red carpet laid out and walks down there with a gold ring on his fingers, you know. You know, and people bow down and kiss his ring and kiss his feet and that kind of thing. Does that remind you of Christ? I don't remember, I don't remember where he ever came in town. They wrote a carpet for him like that, you know, and all that kind of business. I don't, I don't recall that. I recall when Christ went back to Bethlehem or Nazareth and sat down on a throne and had a bunch of people waiting on him, fanning with a peacock fan, you know, and everybody hanging around, you know, to hear what he's going to say when he couldn't do anything. The Pope never healed anybody. Well, Jesus Christ was always the top, big topic of the time when he came in. Nobody talked about Mary. They never did Mary the time of day. And these folks talk about Mary. Mary never caused a stir when she was around. Nobody even said hello to her. In Acts chapter 1, they're praying in their room. The last mention you have of Mary, she's praying with the women. And the, the apostle not even sent hello to her when she comes in, let alone praying to her. It's Jesus. No life like this one. They look for him to come on a white horse, and he comes on a mule. They look for him to come down from heaven with armies, which he's going to later on, and he shows up in a stable. In the most solemn hour in a woman's life, he's going down the valley of death to bring forth a little old boy, born in a stable with no medical care. There, 
He's born there, but he comes down there, he's born in a in the straw in a straw bed with you know, malodorous odor of unwashed boots, camels, and goats, and cow and cow's dung in a stable on the straw, full of infants. Uh, somebody like him could have left and come down and stayed in Jupiter for a while and come gradually down and then become Caesar for a while and then become the chief rabbi for a while and then become, you know, a slow step down. But he steps out of New Jerusalem and comes all the way from there right down to a stable. Well, you're raised in a barn. Yeah, raised in a barn. Born in a barn. Born among cattle and poverty soil. Is any life like this one? I don't know where it'd be. It isn't Muhammad. I've studied Muhammad. I've done the Koran through for 14 times. And all the imams and the elams, commentators, common Arabic commentators on it. Uh, his life alongside of Christ, uh, Muhammad's life, makes Muhammad look like a clown. The idea of a man marrying a nine-year-old girl. The very idea. And he's calling him your role model. One of his wives was his daughter-in-law. You know what the Old Testament yeah. says about if you die marrying his daughter-in-law? You're going to kill him, that's what it says. He <laughs> was a role model. I can the fellow saying, if your enemies get in your way and don't submit to Allah, then and wage a holy war against them. Why, he didn't, uh, he didn't tell you to kill his enemies. He let his enemies kill you. There were five million Christians who suffered as martyrs on the enemy of Christ in our age. They're hanging up there saying, like Stephen, the father was getting to know what way not to send to their charge. What a difference in people. You take a look for him to show up with a shining armor, a shining, a, a, a knight in shining armor, and he shows up with a, in a poncho, that's a, that's a ship, uh, a, a fisherman's coat, and he has a towel wrapped around him, and he's getting down there washing the feet of dirty fishermen. Uh, dirty fishermen, fishermen have dirty feet. Uh, the old saying is, old fishermen never die, they just smell that way. <laughs> But you imagine down there, kneeling down there in front of them with that towel, girded with a towel, waiting on them and washing their feet. I'd have been like trying to Peter. I said, you know, wash my feet. I'd have said, that's just that what he said. I can't imagine any more terrible than think about my Lord bowing down in front of me. My God. That hurt. I understand it. That hurt him. That hurt him bad. Of course, Lord, no, I'll talk you out of it. He said, well, if I don't wash, you don't have any part with me. Well, okay, in that case, <laughs> give me a bath. <laughs> The heart's in the right place. He just opened his big mouth too much, but his heart was in the right place. But you know better by like this. And you know we fundamentalists do sometimes, and I say we, I'm just guilty as other than anybody. That's why I say we. I never say we unless I'm included. I don't say if we accept Christ our Savior, we'll get saved, and we didn't just, no, you do. <laughs> I'm saved. I can say 14th of March. I'm not going to say if we accept Christ. I have accepted Christ. Have you noticed how many we preachers you got in the radio? Yeah. We need to do this, and we need to do that, and we just aren't right, and we aren't coming to church. You mean you ain't? You testifying, buddy? I'm talking about you. You need to be saved. I know what I would say. But you take, we fundamentalists, I do this sometimes, we put so much emphasis on the deity of Christ, we forget something. You always forget, we forget he was a man. He wasn't just God of very God. I believe that. I believe in the deity of Christ, no doubt about it. But he was man of very man, like the old Presbyterian Catechism says, and that's part of his right. He was God of very God, man of very man, two natures. A uh, fundamentalist like the Gospel of John, I do, is his deity. But the Gospel of the Son of Man is least. That's his humanity. And you take the Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, what you keep forgetting, and sometimes I forget, is someday you'll look right in the face of a man. Not God as a spirit, but as a man. Someday you're going to look right in the eyeballs, the one I've been talking about all these years. And he's going to have toenails and fingernails. You keep forgetting that. I know he's God manifest in the flesh. I believe that, but the Bible said, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the thing which he suffered. God don't have to learn nothing. But Christ did. See that book? Treacherous, isn't it? Tricky, boy. Tricky. You know what Catholics think about you, Baptists? They think you're a heretic. You know why? Because you won't call Mary the mother of God. Amen. All right, was Christ God manifest in the flesh? Was it? Sure he was. Did he have a mother? Okay, Mary's the mother of God. See? 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 Ain't a word of truth in that. But boy, it's just set up, isn't it? You see, the part of that Mary is connected with is the son of man. But he has two natures. Did God ever get tired? I don't think so. Did God ever get thirsty? I don't guess so. 
Uh, he sat down with Jacob as well, being thirsty, and says, the woman, give me something to drink. Do you think God has to ask you for a drink? After he made all the fountains and seas and oceans and springs, probably has to ask you for a drink. He wouldn't ask you for a drink. Do you think God gets tired to go down to bed at night, lie down and go to sleep? Not God, but Christ did. See? 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 There's two natures. And that means he knows what it's like to suffer as a man. I sure am glad of that. Amen. You know what? I never could get to know him. I can't comprehend something God like that Bible speaks about. Thus saith the Lord, I know the things that come into your mind, every one of you. Not a hair of your head will fall to the ground. A sparrow doesn't fall to the ground without my father knowing it. What kind of a God is that? I can't get along with him. You think I can get along with God? Thus saith the Lord, do I not fill heaven and earth? He knows where all the atoms are on the backside of Jupiter. Now how me, him, me want to have fellowship? Are you kidding? I'm down here like an ant or a grasshopper and a pile of ants running around. But I don't like God like that. A God can see in every house in Canton 24 hours a day and know the conversations. How do you have fellowship with a God like that? I can't. Well, no, no, nothing close to us, you know. But when he comes down like a man and then hurts and then bleeds and then suffers and then dies, I get that. I'm sure I'm glad he showed up. Amen. Considered his life. Consider his life. Behold a man, behold a man's life. Nothing like it. Behold something else. Behold his friends. Did anybody ever have friends like this one? Who in the world ever had friends like this one? I don't know anybody in the world has friends like this one has. Uh, you'd think his friends would be the big shots, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that, be the, wouldn't that be the big shots? But they weren't. They weren't. They were the little shots. He's a common, ordinary man. He's a carpenter. Is that common enough for you? He hung out with commercial fishing, that common enough. I never could understand why a man who was a man's man got turned up his nose at Jesus Christ like he was a sissy or something that preachers preach about to make a living. He's an ordinary, common day laborer like you. Carpenter. Imagine first century carpenter. What would it be like with your hands? He said, I haven't got a place to sleep at night. The birds have nests. The foxes have holes. But the son of them slept outdoors at night. We got a funny concept about Christ. Christ, he's not somebody that preachers preach about to make a living and scare folks quick. He's somebody that went through what you went through and felt what you felt, and he can sympathize with you because he's your friend. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. One time a little girl came from Sunday school, and her mother said, did you enjoy Sunday school, Edith? And she said, yes, I did. And she said, well, Edith, what they, what they talk about in Sunday school, they talked about me. I said, oh, they didn't talk about you, Edith. Yes, they did. She said, what was the Sunday school lesson about? She said, it was about me. And mother said, now, Edith, don't lie like that. It couldn't have been about you. What was the Bible text? And she said, well, the Son of Man received the sinners and eateth with them. <laughs> That's good. I mean, the Son of Man received sinners and Pete Ruckman with them. He died for sinners. I don't know why you turn if you know that. A man just like you are. Behold his friends, common, ordinary, plain people. That's the kind of business. Uh, you, you take, he, he puts a tempest to hush, he puts a storm to sleep at sea in the Galilee. He stands up there and says, Peace be still. The waves stop and the wind quit howling, and that sea goes to sleep like a baby in its mother's arms. <coughs> and where is he after that? How come he's not down there hobnobbing with Pilate and Caesar and Herod, the big shot? That's quite a news item. And if a man stopped a typhoon or a hurricane from coming in or a tornado here in, in Canton, he wouldn't with the press be after him. And what did you say? How did you do it? What did you do? And I began I would just listen so. What did you feel when you heard the first wind stop? But what did you think? All oh, that kind of stuff. Not him. You know where he is? He's lying the back end of a boat in a pile of dead fish. He's out there a commercial fisherman. That's what you do. I've been out with him at night down there in Florida. You get a big pile of maybe some tire about to sit in there. You fall down the dip pile of dead fish and go to sleep with the cook starts cooking breakfast. He's out there with a bunch of fishermen, a pile of dead fish after stopping a storm. Those are his friends. You ever think about what a character he was as a man? I mean, how about raising Lazarus? Here, here's a guy that's been dead for four days. Here's a bunch of stupid charismatics in Canton, Ohio, saying, uh, he said, the works that I do, greater shall you do. I'd like to see you get a man out of the cemetery after him down there four days. You're not going to do that. You're not going to walk on water or anything else. You got your Bible all screwed up. 
But you think that raising that man from the dead after four days, or how come the press wasn't all over him? And now we take you to Rome, and what do you say at Rome? And now in Athens, Greece, the news is leaves Athens, Greece, and here is Dr. Smellfungus, who's been a Greek teacher here for many, many years. And what does he say? And how does this match the talk of blah, 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 blah? You see him watching that boob too, that idiot stuff just coming out by the hour. And where was he after that thing? He's at a country farmhouse eating. Mary and Martha, Lazarus, please pass the cornbread, please pass the key, <laughs> unless he's a rest to roll off. <laughs> His friends are ordinary, common people. Not some elite crowd, the ordinary people, plain people. Where is he on the road to Emmaus? He comes up from the dead after performing the, the, the inhuman and supernatural feat of raising himself up by his own bootstraps out of the grave after three days. Does he go to hot pilot? He don't fool him. Does he go to Herod? He don't fool him. You go to the chief rabbi and down the commercial, the, 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 a minister association, get him there and tell him what he did. He's out there walking around with two day laborers and you ain't know one of their names. Know the name of one of them, not the name of the other one. He comes there alongside and says, uh, what are you talking about? How can you so sad? And they said, are you a stranger only and don't know about the things that come to pass there these days? And that character says, what thing? <laughs> Isn't that something? You talk about a character, the Lord's a character. I reckon he'd know what things are happening to him. <laughs> Don't you know what's happening? No, tell me about it. <laughs> that weird. <laughs> and he goes by there and they want to have to stop and eat for a while. He says, no, i got to go on. They say today is far spent. Come on, get a snack here and say, well, no, i really got to go on. We like that to say, no, I really must. Oh, please say it. He pretended like he was going to go further, see. The Lord's a character. He's going to mess with him. He's a character. He'll fool you to see what you got in your mind. Amen. You know how the Lord did that? He wants to feel welcome. That's the way some of you are. You like that? You want people to say, please, you know, please stay, you know, don't go, and see, you like that. Uh, I'm a little bit dehumanized. I, that stuff doesn't impress me much. I don't know. When I say no, that's it. See you later. <laughs> I think some folks they like that. You know why folks don't hate my preaching? You know why? I don't make an effort to uh, adjust myself to you. Now, you know how I preach? I got a pile of stuff over here and I put a shovel in it like that and I pick it up and I say, you ready? Okay, here she comes. Out she comes. Take it or leave it. You know what I've learned years and years living with people? I learned if a man is looking for the truth and wants the truth, he'll take it no matter how you give it to him. Amen. But I've learned if a man doesn't want the truth, I don't care how sweet you fix it up, He'll not take it. Amen. So I just never bother to be accommodating. I'd say, here it is, you want it? <laughs> we used to have big youth camps up here. Camp Chalk, you know, had them up in Detroit uh, and Ohio down there in Chautauqua. All the kids would come down from the fundamental Baptist church and I'd preach to them. And I'd come to some, there'd be, sometimes be 1,200 kids there in that, that crowd of campers. And the first night I'd get up, I'd say this. When I look out across this vast uh, congregation of eager, anxious young faces and realize how many of you are never going to mount the hill of beans, my heart sinks down in my shoes and associates with my brain. <laughs> then a good positive way to start a meeting. You <laughs> why do you do that? Because I know human nature. Now, when I say that, you know what happens? I know what happens. All the touchy, sensitive boys out there, they're never going to do nothing. They sit there and they think, well, who does he think he's talking to? Well, I don't like that tone of voice. The very idea of saying, well, that's just the ones I want to get rid of. And when I say that, you know who's out there going to do something? You know what he is? That kid takes one listen and he says, is that right? You think I'm going to do nothing for us? I'll show you, buddy. That's the boy I want. That's the boy I want. Those are my friends. He had a strange bunch of friends, didn't he? Now I say, behold, something else. I say, behold his enemies. They were rich. They were religious. Did you get that? They were rich and religious. They were proud. They were cultured. They were highly educated. You know why preachers are crude and above as rude as I do many times? I do it on purpose. I know how to preach slick and smooth. I was raised in the Anglican church. I bet some of you weren't. I was raised with split chancel, one pulpit over here and one pulpit over here, and the preacher standing up there saying, And so, silent people, 
as he went out upon the water. I said, oh, yeah, man. I mean, pipe organ, you know, 40 feet high, you know, cool, dark sanctuary, people there, you know, sleeping and all that stuff. I know how to talk smooth and how to talk slick. I'm a reactionary. I saw my mother and dad go to hell under that preaching. And I'd have gone to the hell under that preaching if I'd stayed there. I made up my mind when I got saved and God called me to preach. They may not like what I say. They may hate it and hate my guts. But by God, they're going to understand what I say when I get to saying it. So be clear. You're not going to mistake me for one of his enemies. Now, I'm, you may, may think I'm your enemy. I'm your enemy. But you ain't going to mistake me for one of his. His enemies were religious. I'm not the least bit religious. I'm saved. Amen. And his enemies were highly educated. I'm hella highly educated, but it didn't take. <laughs> I keep it right down the level where it ought to be, see? So you won't mistake me for one of them. I mean, one of the greatest compliments I ever had in my life I had from a mission bum down in Mobile, Alabama. I finished preaching down there, he come up to me, about three sheets in the wind, two of them blown away. He came up there and he said, there's a, hey, you remember me? <laughs> I said, no, I remember you. He said, I got saved under your meeting here last year. <laughs> I said, well, you ain't doing so good, are you? <laughs> he said, no, I'm not. But I'll tell you one thing. So I, I miss the freight train out of here at night to preach because you're the only guy I could ever could understand. <laughs> now, you know what that is to me? I, I, I wouldn't take an Academy Award for that. That old drunk missed the freight train out to hear me preach because you don't understand me. That's what I want. All the rest of the stuff, you can take it. One time, Mel in Pensacola, a fellow pulled me up at night. He's a fellow I used to get drunk with. And I've been saved in about 30 years. I hadn't heard it from him in 30 years. One night, he pulled me up. He was a little bit tight. Pulled me up. He's crying. He says, Pete, he says, come, over, come over here and help me and my wife. Me and my wife having trouble, Pete. He says, come on, help me. I said, okay, about 11 o'clock at night. And I went over there. And I came to the house. And he came up to me, his wife sitting over there. And on the couch, both of them a little bit drunk, not bad, a little bit drunk. And he come up to me and when I came to the door, he opened the door and grabbed a hold of me and he said, Pete, he said, show me Jesus, Pete, show me Jesus. Boy, you ought to have that late on at 11.30 at night. <laughs> show me Jesus. I just happened to have one of those something like it is tracks in my pocket with this picture on it. And I pulled it out and said, there, like that. And that old boy dropped me and he's right in front of me going to cry like a baby. I knelt down let him to Christ. When I got through, he got up to his knees and he said, Come my wife, please come my wife. She's sitting there just frozen, boy. Just like a statue <laughs> in the horse bed. And I saw him next to her, I said, Are you saved, sister? And she said, uh, I'm an Anglican. I'm a member of the Episcopal Church. I said, I, I was too far out of saving. Yeah. She said, But I had a godfather and a godmother. I said, I did too far out of saving. And she said, But I've been Christian. And I said, I was too before I was saved. Mm -hmm. That old drunken husband began to laugh. And he said, is he there? Is he there? I told you Pete Ruckman to tell you the deep black truth. <laughs> That's the first time I ever the word damn connected with the truth. <laughs> I told you Pete Ruckman to tell you the deep black truth. Now, see, that probably don't mean anything to you. I wouldn't take the pretty for that. You know why? That old boy knew there was one preacher in that town that wouldn't soft soap his wife and lie away around. He'd tell her she's going to hell, she's going to hell. And he got the right preacher. He got the right preacher. Those are his friends, ordinary folks, common folks, plain folks. If you're not saved here this morning, there's something about you I don't understand, I'll never understand. And that's what I can't understand is why you think he is, why, why do you think he's your enemy? What are you afraid of him for? Why don't you trust him? You pray for him to come to wreck your life or something to mess you up? Go we'll try him out. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God and prayer. Jesus, what a friend of sinners. Amen. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Amen. Nobody ever did. Consider his enemies. I say something else. I say, uh, behold. I say, behold his death. Behold his life. Behold his death. What's his death? Well, it's a terrible death, a painful death. Crucifixion is one of the most painful deaths there is. Sometimes they'd be on that cross for two or three days alive. The birds coming down and pecking them, pecking their eyes out, that kind of thing. Dehydrated, no water. Dehydrated, no, no, no water. Bones pulled out of joint. Not busted, but pulled out of joint. Uh, then 
hallucinations, trauma, loss of blood, that kind of thing. And uh, that's a painful death. It's a substitutionary death. The death of Christ, the death for others. He's not dying for himself. He's not dying for his sins. He's dying for your sins. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave us his son to be a propitiation for our sins. He says, Greater love hath no man this, but he laid down his life for his friend. But God commended his Lord towards us, and that while we were yet sinners. Did you get that? While we were yet sinners, yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more now being justified be by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. If I could get one thing across to anybody in America, anytime, any place, anywhere, I'd get across just one thing. You can't get to heaven by anything. If you ever wind up back with God in heaven, you'll get there by a person, not by a thing. You got that? Religion is a thing. You never make it. Sacraments are things. You never make it. Baptism is a thing. You never make it. A golden rule is a thing. You never make it. A religion is a thing. You never make it. In that book, that book says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he, 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 he is a person. He shall save his people from their sins. I want to ask you something. Have you ever had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ? Have you ever run into him? Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he, 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 not it, he. They keep thinking and saying. What's Catholicism? It's a religion. What's Protestantism? It's a religion. What's Hinduism? Taoism? Those are the quickest ways to hell you can get. They're things. You don't get saved by a thing. You get saved by a person. He has to be alive and you can't be saved. Amen. If he's dead, it's a dead person. A dead person can't save anybody. He has to be alive. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Oh, it's a terrible death, the death of a slow, long-suffering, a substitutionary death, death for others. Greater love hath no man this, and he laid down his life for his friend. But God, listen, God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. What does that mean? That means the Son of Man has not come to call the righteous, but sinners, 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 sinners to repent. Is there a sinner in the tent? Amen. If I could find a sinner, I'd sure have a good message for him. Some of these can't find any sinners. They're all positive thinkers and humanists and Catholics and Protestants and charismatics. He didn't die for those people. He died for sinners. And But if you ever get saved, you're not going to get saved as a man or as a woman or as a white or as a black or a general or a private or a Protestant or a Hindu. If you ever get saved, you're going to get saved as a sinner. Christ died for sinners. No love like this one here. Christ died not just for our sins, but for sin. Christ didn't just die for his friends, he died for his enemies. Here is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be a propitiation for our sins. It was love that sent the Savior to this world of sin and woe. It was love that left heaven's portals and came down to dwell below. It was love that spilled the water on the stormy Galilee. And it was love that paid sin's ransom one dark day on Calvary. Love so sublime, love so divine, Love that is deeper than any sea. Love for us all, oh, how can it be? It is love that still is knocking at the hearts of sinful men. It is love that never tires, but that knocks and knocks again. It is love that solves all problems in this world of sin and strife. But it is love, the love of Jesus, that brings hope and peace and life. 
love so divine, love so sublime, love that is deeper than any sea, love for us all, oh how can it be? Are you saved? Amen. See, the church had nothing to do with it. The priest lied to you, the preacher lied to you, the whole bunch lied to you. The church has nothing to do with it. The sacraments have nothing to do with it. Your life's got nothing to do with it. In the book, you're saved by what he did. Amen. Now, see that? I'm saved. You see, Robin, how do you know you're saved? I'm covered. Amen. See that? You got any coverage? That's my coverage. You think I'm telling the fact that I'm a saved minister because I'm a minister that I'm gonna, that's going to save me? Tell me full of ministry. Amen. I'm not saved because I love my wife and true to her, although I am. I'm not saved because I give above the tithe, although I do. I'm saved because somebody paid my bill. Amen. You won't take it? Okay, but you pay your bill. Right. You sin against God? You know how long God lives? He lives forever. Amen. You know how long you'll pay? Guess. Guess. Holes in his head. Pierces in his head. Thorns in his, in his head. Taking blood out of his head. Why? My sins of intellect. Blood out of his hands. What for? I put my hands place I had no business putting in. Blood on his feet. What for? The place I went to I had no business going. He got a spear thrust in his side by his heart. What's that for? My sins of affection. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. Are you saved? You see what the question means? There's nothing to do with how you're living. The question is, where are you going when you die? And you're going up or you're going down. And if your sins are paid for, you're going up. And if they're not paid for, you're going down. There's the payment. Payment. Death. Death. Pierce. Hands pierced. You handle little children. What did, he, what did he do wrong? Here, feet pierced. He never went to the wrong place in his life. Here, scars all over his head. What evil thoughts did he have? None. None. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's what's going on. I'm not through yet. Behold his, let's behold his uh, portrait. That's what we're doing here, painting the portrait. Behold his portrait. That's his picture. There never lived an artist who didn't sooner or later try a picture of the crucifixion. Even the abstractionist, the pointless, and the surrealist eventually try to get some get a cross in there somewhere. That's where the world meets at the crossroads. The condemnation of this world, brethren, is that God sent one man to this world without sin. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. God sent one man to this world without sin, and the world won't have him. And the world looks at him and says, Well, I can't live it. Yeah, but he lived it. Don't, don't sit there and tell me you're a good man and don't love Jesus Christ. I don't believe you, buddy. I don't believe you. Oh, he's a good fellow. He's not saved, but he's got a heart just as good as gold. He's got a heart black and ace of spades. Looks like the bottom side of a wet rock in a July afternoon. You say, how? Put two of them together. Would a good man love him? Yeah. Would a good woman love him? You're a woman. You call yourself a good woman. You don't love Jesus Christ. I don't believe you. I think you're a bad woman. Bob Jones Sr. said the worst moral monstrosity in this world is a woman that doesn't love Jesus Christ. The women of his day, they knew who he was for. Maybe all the apostles were men, all the elders were men, all the deacons were men. Maybe it's a macho book written by men. But any woman knows what happens to a woman in a country where they keep that book and a woman where they don't have that book. And if you ladies think that book don't make a difference for you, go over there in Iraq and Iran and live there for a while in Cambodia and Thailand. You'll see how women get treated that don't have that book. They knew. They knew what it was. The Bible said the women followed him to the cross. The women followed him to the tomb. They knew he was on their side. They knew it. Consider the portrait. What am I drawing you? Well, my beloved is uh, fair. His hair is bushy and black as a raven. Your little yellow-brown-haired Christ you see in television is a pimp. He's a freak. This fellow's a Jew. What does that mean? Hook nose. My beloved is white. Oh. <laughs> what are you going to do with that Bible? Get rid of it. 
That's King James. My beloved is white. You won't find that in NIV. You say, why? Because they're racist. That's why. He says, my beloved is white and ruddy. R-U-D-D-Y. You know what that means? That means red-brown. That's Shem. Most people are brown. They're not black. They're not white. Most people are brown. Who well, knows? They got it in the land masses and look at them, boy. The word Adam means red-brown dirt. That's what you made of it. My beloved has eyes like a dove's eyes. The gray eyes of a dove. You ever look at them? Has dove's eyes. His hair is, hair is bushy and black as a raven. You know, Veronica, she said she got his uh, Xerox photostatic copy and color on a handkerchief when he was on the way to the cross. She, she lying like a dog. And then there was a fellow named Len Tullis, a Roman senator, that said he saw Christ one time. And he said he was a tall, graceful man that moved smoothly and gracefully with a, with a, a mellow voice, you know. I know what that is. That's a freak. That, that's the Christ you see in the films. He's a big, long robe kind of swishing around, you know, and, you know, blessed are the pure in the heart, for they shall see God. <laughs> the man was a carpenter. You ever see a carpenter's hands after 18 years in a carpenter shop? Yeah. He's sleeping out doors at night. You got a thing with a saint. You got a thing with some girl scout you're thinking of Jesus Christ. The Roman saw the senator, the Roman uh, emperor says, behold the man. You think he knew a man when he saw them? Years ago, we had a bunch of teenagers put out a rock opera, and they said it was a picture of uh, a rock picture, a modern picture of uh, the gospel. It wasn't a modern picture of the gospel. The gospel is that Christ died for your sin, was buried, rose from the dead. And the rock opera, at the end of that opera, you know whom they had alive? They had Judas alive, and they had Christ dead. That ain't the gospel. The gospel is Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, and that ain't according to the scriptures. Now you take the teenage Christ in that thing was kneeling down praying and the prayer, I've seen the prayer, Oh Father, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I sometimes I doubt myself and my disciples doubt me and I try to tell them what to do and lead them right, but sometimes they just don't understand and Lord, I don't know exactly what to do. That is Christ. The Christ that binds up that garden of Gethsemane down there with the blood and sweat running off and it says, Not my will but thine be done. Now come on, girls. You think it don't take a man to say that? Then why don't you try it? You think it would take a girl to say that? You think it would take a man to say that? Not my will, but find it on. Try it. Some of you characters go home today and get back in the bedroom and close the door and get out in your face and tongue and groove and say, okay, Lord, from now on, not my will, but yours be done. A girl scout can't do that. That takes a man. Jesus Christ, superstar, rock up. Oh, sissy played that thing. He had to cut it himself six times before he could bleed doing push-ups. <laughs> what a man, the life guard in a, in a whirlpool. <laughs> you ever notice when a rock bunch take off their clothes and try to pose like men? Then something's wrong. They look just as white as paste, and their bicep looks like a flea bite on a piece of spaghetti, you know. <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's a rock star Jesus. <laughs> this Jesus here is a man. And he says, behold the man, behold the man, behold this portrait. But I'm not going to argue with you about it. He doesn't look like this anymore anyway. This is human look. This is what he looked like on this earth. He was a Jew, a Judean Jew from the tribe of Judah. So he looked like that. Now, without form, now, no commonness in him, no beauty in him, we should desire him. But I, he doesn't look like this now. If I painted a picture like he is now, you wouldn't believe it. John saw, you know what he said he looked like now? He said he has his eyes like a flame of fire and hair white as snow. Why is it white? Well, white hair is a picture of trouble. Trouble. I, that Savior there, you don't have a trouble, you've got that he hasn't seen before. A man of sorrow and a claim of grief. That's what gives him white hair. The ancient of days, I mean, he's been around a long time. And he's acquainted with suffering. He stood by Mark Rufus, the died of worms. He stood by Hans Popoff when he was being tortured. He stood by Richard Lundbrock when he was in solitary. He was standing by you and try to trouble you can get into. He's a patient Christ. He's a suffering Christ. And you can't bring him a new problem. A little girl said her mother said, uh, uh, how come he have gray hairs like that? And she said, well, that's because of you. The trouble you give me caused me to worry. That's because of the gray hairs. And the girl said, boy, when you were young, you sure must have been a terror. Look at Grandma. <laughs> now, he said, that is, that he said he has hair white as snow and eyes like a flame of fire. That's his position now. 
Now finally I want to say this about it. I say, behold the man, I say, behold his portrait, I say, behold his influence. No man ever lived on this earth or ever will live on this earth that had the influence Jesus Christ had. You say, how, what do you mean by that? What are you not thinking? Tell me the name of one man's birthday who celebrated 15 million times a day. 15 million times a day, that might be conservative. You want to get your hunting license? You know what you signed? 2002. From whose birthday? You want to get a marriage license? From whose birthday? Got a daily newspaper? From whose birthday? Got a weekly magazine? From, did you graduate from school? When? From his birthday. 15 million times a day, be conservative. What are you going to get a driver's license, a hunting license, a fishing license from? 2002, B.C. or A.D.? Arnold Domini, the year of our Lord. The year of our Lord. That must drive Madeline Murray O'Hare crazy. Of course, she's over dead, I guess, after a while, but anyway. I bet that bothered her. I bet that bother thinks she's an atheist and yet her birthday is dated from his birthday. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Have you ever run into Jesus Christ? You ever had a head on collision with him? If you ever do, you'll never be quite the same again. Amen. I'm not saying you'll be sinless. You'll have your problems. I'm not saying you'll grow in grace quickly. Some do quick, some do slow. I'm not saying that. But I'll tell you, once you run to him, you'll never be quite the same again. I was going to say, man, 27 years, and that isn't very long to be able to say, but some men live faster than others. By the time I was 27, I knew what a life of a dance band musician was like, and a hillbilly dance band drummer. I knew what it was like to be the life of an artist. I knew what a life, I wrote poetry. I knew what a life of an army officer was like when I was 27. I had four years in the infantry. I knew what it was to be a disc jockey. I, I had a bartender and a lifeguard in the summertime. I had some experience to see. And coming up through that kind of stuff like there, I was a wicked, godless, depraved, stupid young man. I can remember. I can remember when I got saved. I had to pay the baptistry in uh, in Dixon Mills, Alabama. But I went in there and knelt down that baptistry to paint that baptistry. The Lord called something to my attention I'd forgotten. And many, many years ago, when I was in the Philippines, a drunken army officer teaching hand-to-hand -hand combat, you know, and unarmed combat, that kind of stuff, how to kill each other. And while I was doing that, I, I drew a picture of the Last Supper with all the disciples drunk. I had Christ sitting there cross-eyed, and Peter vomiting, and John passed out across the table, and Thomas' and leg sticking out from the table. And I went around and showed that thing to guys in the army. I thought it was funny, you know. I said, get a little that, man. And they, 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 didn't, they didn't think it was funny. They, they were just lost I was, but they were religious. I wasn't even religious. And some of those guys would say, man, Ruckman or something, it just ain't funny. <laughs> I said, yeah, look at that, <laughs> you know. Well, I got to say, I had to paint this baptistry. I get I'm leaving the baptistry, get I'm leaving the baptistry, and I hold out the brushes and the turps like this and ask God to bless them. About the time I asked God to bless them, the Lord said, hey, you remember that picture over in the Philippines? And I said, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> well, you, you see the reason why I shouldn't take your hands off the wrist right now? I said, no, I don't. And I know up there, I thought, I thought like, a, like a sickle was going to fly through the air and take off my wrist. <laughs> and the Lord said, okay, now you can draw. I've been drawing for him ever since. What happened? Head-on collision. People in Pensacola, they don't know what's happened to me yet. You talk about a prophet not without honor in his own country. I had to pass the church I was saved in. I've been right in the town where I was saved in for 53 years. And people in that town, they see me coming down the street, saw them get across the street to get away from me. They don't they know what's happened. <laughs> the last time they saw me was up there with a swinger and a set of drums, boy. Throwing a coat bottle down there in case they got rough, you know. And my bill holding the snare that a muffle the sound. The next time they see me, I'm driving down the street in a car, picking up kids for daily vacation Bible school. And my car is a big bunny rabbit in the back of it. For them to know to get in the car with the bunny rabbit. <laughs> and there's Ruck with this dance band drummer, this lifeguard, this DI going down there and get in the car with the bunny rabbit. <laughs> they haven't got to pick it out yet. I don't think I have, but I sure do enjoy it. If any man is in Christ, he's a what, folks? He's a new creature. Old things have passed away, all things have come new. I had a friend of mine up in Alaska, he was a, he was a missionary, 
he told me about one of the most godless characters I've ever heard of, and I've heard of some. But that guy would get drunk and go in these uh, uh, liquor stores at night and these discos and places and dance halls, and Wednesday night he'd go in there and get up on a table and get drunk and hold mock testimony meetings. He'd get up there and say, Oh, that's how testimony is, son of your fool. How about you, brother? <laughs> Prayer, what kind of stuff? Some guy get up and thank God for some old woman with cat housing around with some guy get up and thank God for a secret of seven he had. You know, mean character. <laughs> You see what happened to him? God didn't kill him. God saved him. The old boy got saved, and the week after he was saved, he's right back in those places passing out tracks. And so, so what happened to him? Head-on collision, boy. You'll never be the same after you get that head-on collision. There's something there going to be different. It's going to stay different. Down there in French, Florida, we had a lady, wicked lady, French-Canadian. Her name was Dubois. Boy, she gets angry with her husband. You hear her shout and cuss him a half a block off. Then she got real sick. And then she went to the hospital. Then one day I got a call from the chaplain down at the Naval Air Station. And he said, show me your women been here. And they tell me they think Mrs. Dubrock got saved. I said, well, I hope so. A couple of weeks went by and she was dying of cancer. And she died of cancer. The day she died of cancer, uh, a couple of my women were in there when the priest came in. She was a French, Canadian, Roman Catholic. The priest came in to do the absolute condition, last rites, you know, he had his bells, his candles, you know, and his Hollywood spook costume. He came there, you know, carrying all his junk, you know, and she was lying there, weak, probably shut up, bones collapsed. And they said that after a while they saw her lips moving and somebody said she saying something and everybody got quiet to hear what she was saying and she was singing. That old cussing 45 year old Roman Catholic friend came and lying in that bed, wasting away, and they, well, they got real quiet to hear she was singing. Jesus loves me, this I know, oh, the Bible tells me so, little one to him below. There, my God, what happened to her? Head on, boy, head on. Made him head on. His influence, there's no influence on earth like his influence. You can't find a man who influence you like he can. Are you saved? Old Pilate says, Behold the man. Boy, he says, Behold the man. He's talking about a man. I mean a man. I wish somebody would write a book uh, sometime on Jesus the Great. Nobody like him. Behold the man. Do you know him or don't you know him? If you don't know him, why don't you know him? The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We got a uh, president many years ago in this country named Calvin Coolidge. And Calvin Coolidge was noted for his brevity of speech. He wouldn't talk to anybody more than a couple of minutes. And Calvin Coolidge one time was something they were kind of making fun of him. He was old-fashioned, believed the Bible. And one time one of his uh, fellow uh, politicians, another congressman, said to him, he said, uh, President, you read the Bible a bit, don't you? He said, yes, I read it every day. And he said, tell me something, President. He said, uh, what does the Bible say about going to hell? You know what he said? He said, it says you don't have to go. <laughs> That's what it says. Yeah. You know what it says about hell? It says you don't have to go. You say, what have you got to do? You have to accept the payment that God made for you. Yeah. How many of you folks can put your finger on the time and place when you came to Christ the sinner and trusted that payment? Let me see your hand. All right. Now, if you can't put your hand on the time and place, we're getting ready to leave here and make now the time and place. You said, doubt my salvation. You say, every doubt your salvation, rough me the eye down my salvation about three times a year. You say, how long? Oh, about five seconds, something like that. She's like this. Now, see this thing right here? I'm leaning on this. You see, got my whole weight on this thing right here. Now, if you move that thing, I'm going right down there. That ain't a relative truth. <laughs> That's an absolute. I got my whole weight right here. Now, look, tell a fire down there, hell is burning down there, you know what I'm counting on keeping out of hell? Right here. I got my whole weight right there. Give that thing away, I'm gone. I get like this, whatever comes around and says, hey, Ruckman, you're just living a pipe dream. You're living off drugs, man. You weren't really saved. You're going to hell. I say, well, good, leave me alone and have a good time. <laughs> well, I don't leave it here. They'll come around and say, well, you're going to hell. You don't want to go to hell. You know, I don't want to go to hell. Well, don't you better do something? I said, that's all I can do. See you later. Some of you Christians, you let him get engaged in a conversation. 
He says, did I really believe when I had faith? Did I have faith when I believed? Or did I receive when I had faith? Or did I have a faith not to receive? Are you to this before I was saved and I'm still doing it? And I didn't do this and I'm doing worse than I did before I was saved. You get all screwed up. Just rest on him. If what he did can't save me, I'm going to hell anyway, so who cares? Amen. 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 My hope is built of nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness on Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground, don't waste my time with it. All of the ground is taking sand. But you weren't baptized the Holy Spirit. Tough apple, see you later. You didn't talk in tongues, Lord, help yourself on <laughs> I'm counting on him. God help me. Father, bless your word this morning. And I pray for the invitation is given somebody here might do the wise thing and the right thing to do and accept your son as a savior. And I know most of these people know thee. They know about your blood of torment. And thank God they've trusted you. They're safe in the arms of Jesus like the song says. But maybe I've talked to somebody here this morning that never ran into your son. And Lord, I pray while I'm praying right now, the Holy Spirit will run into them. A head-on collision and show them what they've got to do to go to the right place when they die. Question man prayer a few minutes. The Bible said the Holy Spirit has come to convict men of sin, righteous judgment of sin because they believe not on Christ. Now if you can't put your finger on a time and a place where you came to Christ the sinner and trusted his blood atonement to save you a soul, that's what the gospel is all about. And in a moment we're going to stand and sing when we do. Brother Martin, have somebody here to order to meet you and have prayer with you. If you don't understand things, show you how to do it. Or to take a few seconds or minutes to take care of it. Receiving Christ is so easy, you're going to miss it if you're not careful. It's a gift. A six-year-old child can get it. And some of you older folks, if you're looking for something complicated, you're looking for the wrong thing. It's a gift. And you come for the gift, and God will give it to you for nothing. Father, I want to thank you for my salvation. I've been saved now over half a century. And Lord, you're my witness. I never figured I'd make it 40 years the way I'd live before I was a Christian. I don't know what I'm doing here twice out of age, but here I am. And I'm still saved, and I know it's only by grace. I've saved by grace through faith. I've been kept saved by grace and many dangerous calls and snares. I have already come. And grace led me thus far, and grace is going to get me home. And kneeling before you right here, and these people, Lord, I'm, I confess openly, I'm trusting nothing but your son to get me saved. I'm trusting nothing but his brother's tongue. And if that book is a lie, my goose is cooked. I'm betting my soul on what you said. You said if I'd come to you, that you wouldn't cast me down, and I came. You told me if I called upon your name, you'd save me, and I did. And I'm believing what you said. And I have the fullest confidence in you, no confidence in myself. And I pray some man will take that step this morning, and I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing an invitation song here this morning. And the invitation is real simple now. Right now, right now, I'm not giving an invitation for you to join the church. That's a good thing, but things can't save you. I'm not giving an invitation for you to get baptized. <laughs> Getting baptized is a good thing, but things can't save you. I'm giving an invitation this morning. Any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, if you want eternal life, come on and get it. He said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. All right, Father, leave us to the song here.